Should be good now. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. Um, this is our second of our monthly webinar series, From Lab to Industrial Going Pro, hosted by us here at Maritech. Uh, today is episode two, Attack of the Solvents. And for those of you who missed episode one, The Scaling Menace, you can find copies of our uploads of our webinar series on our website and both on our YouTube page. So if you just head over to Maritech.com, you can find everything there. So with you today, you have myself, Kyle Georges. I'm the VP of Sales and Business Development here at Maritech. And I'm accompanied today by my colleague, uh, just like the first uh, webinar series, Lucas Palumbo. He's one of our, he's our Senior Automation and Process Engineer. And to start, a uh, quick agenda of what we'll be going through today. So um, first we'll be going through an introduction and a background. And for those of you who did miss webinar episode one, a quick little recap about that. Uh, for there, we'll be really transitioning into the heart of this uh, discussion, solving the solvent recovery bottlenecks um, in the production landscape, as that really is the core bottleneck a lot of our clients run into, um, especially when scaling their technologies and their operation. And from there, we'll transition into the residual solvents discussion, and decarboxylation, ethanol contamination and discoloration, water buildup and removal, the solvent landscape outside of ethanol, and then we'll finish up with a little preview, a sneak preview at episode three, Revenge of the Myth, and uh, finish off with a question and answer period. So uh, just to recap, uh, Maritech, we've been around for over 50 years and our history as a company comes from the solvent recycling and hazardous waste processing landscape. So we've been manufacturing for many decades now, systems for pharmaceutical, food, paint, printing, aerospace, any industry that there has solvents. Um, and a common thing with all those industries is a lot of our projects were always engineered to order. So all our manufacturing and engineering is in-house. And we're actually located just about 30 minutes north of Toronto International Airport in Canada. Um, you know, over the last seven years, we've been growing significantly in the cannabis and hemp space. And that's now over 70% of our business. And a large, uh, large leading progress of our growth in the cannabis and hemp space has been around our ability to remove bottlenecks. And our focus has really been growing into this cannabis and hemp space was originally just around, okay, how do we recover the solvent out of the oil? Um, but now as it's grown past that, a lot of our clients are continuously coming to us with new issues that they're looking for solutions with. And that's really where we've been growing into, getting now into turnkey automatic winterization systems, um, ethanol reproofing lines, and we're even growing now into complete turnkey ethanol, large scale cryo and warm ethanol extraction facilities, as well as downstream technologies for isolation and distillation and so forth. So uh, this webinar here, as we mentioned, will be really focusing around the solvent bottlenecks and really the issues that come into the solvents in the extraction process, as well as the contamination of these solvents, both with um, other compounds and with water. So just to recap um, from the scaling uh, menace, we dived into the extraction process as a whole. And for those of you here today that are joining us that might not be as well versed with cannabis and hemp extraction as a pro full, as process, um, or what solvents are. Um, generally for cannabis and hemp extraction, you have your biomass in feed. From there, you add a solvent. The most common two really in the industry right now are cryoethanol or supercritical or subcritical CO2 extraction. Um, from there, depending on the extraction process you utilize, you might need to do a winterization step and that's to remove undesirables such as fats, waxes, lipids, chlorophylls, and so forth. And then a filtration process. From there, you get into the major area of bottlenecks, and that's the bulk recovery stage, uh, where you recover most of the solvent out of the ethanol, the residual recovery stage, followed by the decarboxylation step, where we elevate temperature to activate the cannabinoids within the oil itself. And from there, we feed into a heated oil storage, and then from there, you can look to do downstream processing, be it distillate production, isolate production, THC remediation, whatever is really needed. Um, in this PFD, we do uh, highlight our Ameritech F-Series, uh, which is used for inline ethanol reproofing slash water removal out of the ethanol stream. Both uh, myself and Lucas will be diving a little bit more deeper into that later in the presentation. So solving solvent recovery bottlenecks. Um, as I mentioned, this is, uh, especially as our clients are really scaling in the industry and companies are coming to us, this is really kind of the main bottleneck every company runs into when scaling their cannabis and hemp extraction process. So the reason for this is, as you guys know, the webinar series is titled, you know, from lab to industrial going pro. 
And the reason for this is we, we need to, our full goal at Meritech is to really help our clients stop their lab mind step and start thinking industrial. Um, you know, the process right now, a lot of them are looking at them as individual steps, individual processes, individual systems, you know, the first system for bulk recovery, you know, getting most of the solvent out of the oil, a secondary system then, you know, to get the residual ethanol out, ideally most of it, some still even leave some in, which then goes into the decarb step and any ethanol that you've left in now could be boiled off. And if you're just using it as a separate reactor, you're going to be losing, which is another operational cost in your process. And each of these steps is being done by different operators or one operator that's just operating one at a time or can only oversee so many. So each at the end of every process, there's a stop in the production, right? So this is the cause of why, you know, the whole solvent recovery and decarb step really has become a major bottleneck in the hemp and cannabis extraction process. And really our focus in growth in the industry has been around solving it. So this is where the ore solution really comes into play. Now, the ore, ore solution, what is it? Well, that's our, this is our, let's say, main product line, and it's called the ores as it's the, our oil, we call it our oil and ethanol recovery system. Note that the system's not just for ethanol. We can incorporate, we can utilize it with a variety of solvents if you're using pentane, hexane, heptane, whatever it is, not a problem for us. Um, and this really comes from our background. So our initial entrance, as I mentioned, into cannabis and hemp was around the recovery process. So in other facilities and other um, in other industries, you know, the whole eth uh, sorry solvent recovery step is really seen as an auxiliary step, not as a key part of the production process. So the way we've always been designing our technologies and the way we've been planning and automating them is really as a set it and forget it mindset, right? So someone would purchase one of these systems, set it to the side of their plant, and it would really focus on automating their whole ethanol recovery stream or whatever solvent they were recovering. And the real focus was around, you know, don't need, not needing to have an operator there 24 seven. It can operate whether an operator is present or not in the building. Um, you don't need to worry about lots of maintenance or costly maintenance and spare parts. They're very efficiently built with very few moving parts. Um, in fact, actually a big uh, concern from our board, not concern, a big complaint from our board sometimes is that our spare parts and uh, service uh, revenue is not as high as it should be. Um, and we uh, really attribute that to our industrial mindset when it comes to designing these solutions with a set it or forget it mindset. Um, and it's not that we've just taken a technology that was for other industries and just putting into the cannabis and hemp space. Over the last seven years, we've been spending a lot of money and doing a lot of R&D and tailoring these technologies specifically or for cannabis and hemp be it with our demisting technologies, which we'll go over later on to prevent oil entrainment within the ethanol vapors, be it with automating decarb oxalation cycles within the systems, um, be it uh, other steps that we do to ensure a clean, clear ethanol stream, temperature control, vacuum controls, specifically designed and also saved recipes designed for the cannabis and hemp process. And the real goal with this technology here is what we look to do and the way we like to help our clients is this is a bottleneck for a lot of operations. It's actually limiting how much production they can do. So what we look to do here is turn this bottleneck actually into a production increase opportunity. Because now those operators that might have been there operating numerous uh, rotovaps, overseeing many falling film systems, taking the product from one to another and taking it to the decarb reactors, um, also removing the cases for operator errors. We look to remove all that and actually give our clients a production increase opportunity where they can then take these operators and allocate them to increasing extraction yields or extraction process and amounts of throughput or downstream processes like distillate or isolate production. And one other thing too is because of our background in all these other various industries where we had to come in and provide solutions that would work with existing infrastructure and facilities, we can easily integrate with whatever technology you'd like. So if you have another technology you'd like to really utilize in your cannabis or hex, hemp extraction process, not a problem for us. And that's where too, it, we even have clients that come to us with their own IPs, be it something that they already have in an existing form, or even a technology that they want us to work on with them from an R&D standpoint and integrate that IP and build it out for them and integrate it with our solutions. So now we're gonna go a little bit more into residual solvents and decarboxylation. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the ORIS system, it also can incorporate decarb. So really what the oil and ethanol recovery system is, is it's really a three in one solution. You know, you have your bulk recovery step where 80 to 90% averaging around 85% of ethanol is recovered out of your oil. Then you have your final recovery or residual recovery step to recover the rest. And then you have your decarboxylation step. With our ore solution, we can automate all three of these in one system, um, removing all that need. 
So the way the system works is through a variety of phases. Now, phase one, the way phase one is, phase one is just your auto, um, auto fill the system. So it'll automatically fill the system and start to get to temperature. Phase two is your auto top up phase. So now the system's actually reached the required temperature to recover the ethanol out of the system. Um, and meanwhile, just so you guys know, we're operating under vacuum to keep temperatures low, to avoid degradation of your oil, your terpene, et cetera, and also reduce the amount of undesirables that come along with your ethanol stream. So in phase two now, what we're doing is we're automatically continuously recovering out your ethanol out of the system. We have our special demisters there, which I mentioned we'll be going into a little bit more detail later in the presentation, to prevent oil entrainment within the ethanol vapors, which is then continuously condensed and discharged. Meanwhile, in this auto top-up phase, we're continuously auto topping up more of your oil and ethanol stream back into the still. Phase three is our dry out or boil down phase. And this is where we greatly differ from, for example, falling film technologies. And this is where in this step, we can bring you down to virtually 0% ethanol. So we've turned off the auto top up and are focusing now on just getting every little last drop of that residual ethanol out of your stream and why we can guarantee vir virtually 0% ethanol left at the end of this process. From there then, if you'd like, uh, depending on your process, you might want to decarb. We could program then an automatic decarb oxidation cycle where it goes to whatever temperature you'd like for whatever period of time you'd like and at whatever um, vacuum you'd like. And then phase five would be your cool down and automatic discharge. Now, as I did mention, we can provide a guarantee for your ethanol removal to virtually 0%, um, as well as for our throughputs. Um, in fact, actually one of our clients here in Canada, who's a major Canadian LP here in Ontario, Canada, um, they're a leading um, supplier, especially on vapes to many provinces here in Canada. Um, they're getting off of one of our ores lines there, which is incorporated with our turnkey automatic winterization system, zero PPM of ethanol in their oil. Now, one thing I do want to touch on here is our ores systems versus falling film and comparing, you know, a lot of people come to us and they ask for a hundred gallon per hour solution or a 50 gallon per hour solution or so forth. You cannot use a general one-to-one -one uh, comparison on there. Because on a falling film solution, we're recovering 10 gallons per hour. On us, when we say 10 gallons per hour, we're not talking about just doing a bulk recovery. We're talking to take, about taking it down to virtually 0% ethanol, and, as well as decarb. So we're really looking at incorporating three steps into those fl flow rates that we provide and we can provide guarantees on, compared to falling films, just one focus on bulk recovery. And um, one thing that I'll be touching on to, um, as well, is our patent pending end of decarboxylation sensor. So, at the end of the decarb cycle, um, well, the way a lot of people do it right now is uh, just visually, you know, looking at the bubbling of the oil and so forth. What we do, uh, what our patent pending process is here is to automatically detect that endpoint. So instead of decarbing and either visually doing it or then testing it afterwards and being like, oh, it wasn't decarbed enough, you know, it was only 98% decarb, let's increase the temperature slightly, let's increase the duration slightly, we can automatically end that de the, the decarb point right there, thereby even making your process even further efficient and removing it even further bottlenecks. Um, so just to kind of recap, this is kind of a visual representation of the three-in-one formula. You know, the bulk recovery step, the residual recovery step, and the decarb reactor all in one solution. Um, now, one new feature that we're actually releasing, we've just released right now, is we've actually upgraded our ORS three-in-one solution to now a four-in-one solution. And Lucas will be diving into this a little bit later. Uh, but it really resonates around, so we already have our Maritech F-Series, our large-scale fractional distillation systems for inline automatic ethanol reproofing. And that's generally meant for streams where the ethanol has been, you know, already degraded to a significant standpoint. And it does have a quite of a significant capital cost involved. So depending on your operation, it might be the appropriate solution. But here what we're trying to do is trying to provide a lower cost alternative uh, to just give, just to do some what we call inline water diversion. So what it's doing is helping prevent the amount of water that'll be carrying on with your ethanol. And um, the last thing I'll be touching on before giving it over to Lucas is ethanol contamination and discoloration. So this is a uh, an issue we hear about a lot actually um, from groups that are looking to come in with our technologies uh, with their existing operations. Uh, next slide, please, Josh. Um, you know, they, a lot of companies contact us and uh, they have issues, you know, with green ethanol being recovered out or orange or yellow or brown coloring. You know, the green might be from chlorophyll, orange and yellow could be from oil entrainment or other variables, you know. And that, a lot of this has to do with improper recovery settings, right? 
um, you know, doing it at high temperatures, utilizing a system that requires constant supervision and constant tickering, that, that can't think for itself or automate any of the process or put in fail safes to ensure a clean and clear ethanol stream being recovered out. Um, or also decarving and doing the decarb step with residual solvents in it. So a few things here. This is where our Maritech demister solution really comes in to prevent that oil entrainment within the, within the ethanol vapors to give you that clean, clear ethanol output. Um, but also it's all about the, you know, the real-time temperature and vacuum control features that we incorporate within our systems to really help you give you an automated solution to give you that crisp, clean, clear ethanol discharge. Um, one other feature too that we're bringing into our aura systems or we have on our aura systems as well is an automatic cooling jacket. Um, so for clients that are concerned about um, temperature spikes or anything on their oil too, it's another safety mechanism to help protect your oil because it's a highly valuable product. So everything we can do to streamline, automate, and optimize your process, right? And those, those are our words, automate, optimize, and scale. That's really our focus when it comes to designing these systems and helping our clients really transition from that lab to industrial mindset. So now I'll be handing it off to Lucas to continue, um, and he'll be touching on water buildup and removal. Thank you. Great, yeah, thanks a lot, Kyle. So as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, I'm Lucas Palumbo. I'm a senior automation and process engineer at Maritech. And, and I'm gonna be talking about how water gets into your process and, and uh, you know, water and ethanol system in your solvent loop. So ethanol is one of the most useful and widely used solvents because it's non-toxic and it's both polar and uh, non-polar solvent. So this means that on one end of the, eth or the ethanol molecule, you have a hydroxyl group, which is strongly polar. And this lets ethanol dissolve and dissolve into polar substances or water-soluble substances. And the other end of the molecule is a uh, ethyl group, which is a hydrocarbon, and it's nonpolar. So this, let this lets ethanol dissolve uh, nonpolar substances or like oil-based substances. So it's really universal solvent. Um, its properties though mean it has one problem is that the polar portion of it means it can dissolve into a water and they form a homogeneous solution that can't really easily be mechanically separated. So you can't filter them out, you can't decant them, they don't settle into layers. They form a mixture that's pretty hard to separate and, and we'll touch in later in the presentation on what you can do about this. But this means it tends to just accumulate in your process. All the water that's coming in that gets dissolved into your solvent tend to just continue building up um, and dropping the purity of your ethanol. So you can kind of control how much water is getting in. So depending on the scale of your process, it could be hundreds or even thousands of pounds of water could be the mass flow into your process. And if 100% of that's getting into your solvent loop, that's something, you know, you can't give an example later, that's something you can't ignore. It'll become a big problem pretty fast. But Kind of the best case scenario would be a cryoethanol extraction. So that's if your plant material is frozen and the ethanol is chilled below minus 40 and maintained at below minus 40 throughout the extraction, what happens is the, the cells at the surface of the plant freeze and then they aren't really disturbed or penetrated by the ethanol. Because the ethanol is a polar and nonpolar solvent, if it gets inside the cell, it's pulling out like the chlorophyll, starches, sugars, fats and lipids with the polar and nonpolar things, all that's inside the cell. And really the cannabinoids that we're after are in the trichome structures on the surface outside the cell. So in a cryoethanol where the cell's frozen, you can kind of just dissolve what's in the trichomes and get a very, very clean oil and also uh, very, very minimal water will end up in your solvent. But cryoethanol is uh, the most expensive to operate, the most expensive to build, um, so there are reasons, depending on process to process, it might not make as much sense. There is a scale where the refrigeration requirements could become enormous. So warm ethanol is an easier process to do, easier and cheaper, cheaper to operate. But that ethanol will disturb the cell and it'll pull, you'll be pulling out a lot of that water even in the, for the extraction step, which is basically unavoidable, as well as the other um, constituents that become a problem um, they're solvable, but it's a problem downstream. They have to be dealt with the contaminants like starches and, and chlorophyll, et cetera. But there's a issue that with both types of extraction, 
your plant material is going to be soaked in ethanol after you extract from it. So this soaked ethanol is hazardous. The vapors coming off it are flammable. You know, what do you do with it? This is a big waste stream for your process. So one way we deal with that is to screw press the, the, eth or the, the wet plant material, trying to squeeze out that ethanol, but that can mechanically break the cells down and you're squeezing out water now. And then if you take that cake, which is not completely dry, and put it in a uh, low temperature kiln where you're boiling or, and then recondensing the vapor coming out to create a completely dry um, uh, waste product of your biomass, well, if you're drying it out, you're also drying out all the water from it. So that 10 to 20% water the plant is coming in with, it has to all end up in, with your solvent. And like I said, once they mix together, um, you know, they're not very easy to separate. And that happens with cryo and warm ethanol. So if you want to completely close your loop, um, it's very difficult to avoid that water building up. So here we have just a really basic example with some numbers to it. So this would be, say, if you have a warm ethanol extraction or if you're pressing and drying your plant material um, and you're getting basically 100% of the water out that's coming in. You can see if you start with 1,000 pounds of biomass daily, wash it, you know, that's 18 gallons of, of water per day entering your process. Doesn't so sound like a lot, but see, in, in a single week of running this process once per day, you've gone from 95% to 82%. As, and the, as Tom mentioned earlier, we kind of think it's 85% as a, as a lower cutoff. You want to stay above that for a really efficient um, uh, extraction. So very hard to ignore. This problem will happen very fast and you'll, you're going to have to deal with it if you want to close the loop. Now let's talk about it. So you've got water in your solvent inventory. So what can we do about it? There's basically two mechanisms we can take advantage of here to separate the ethanol. Uh, first, we'll start with absorption or differential absorption. This would be a material that would tend to absorb water but not ethanol from a mixture. This would be like molecular sieves. You think of it like typically like a pellet. So what you would do is you would flow your solvent into a tank or some kind of pebble bed reactor with the molecular sieve pellets and you leave it there for some amount of time and it would absorb the water out of the mixture. And here we get to like basically the cheapest to set up and easiest solution would be disposable molecular sieves. You'd fill it with pellets, you'd allow them to absorb as much water as they can until they become saturated. And then the pellets would need to be disposed of. So we kind of think of this as like the laziest solution. It's cheap to set up, but expensive to operate. It would be quite a significant cost at scale to continuously be disposing of these pellets. So, and in fact, even at small to medium scale, disposable molecular sieve pellets are very uneconomical. There is another type, there's, there's pellets or molecular sieves that can be regenerated using by either heating them up or pulling vacuum on them with pressure swings um, that you can reuse them, although they will eventually wear out. The problem with this is now already you need to double your system. Like you need one bank of molecular sieves that's processing and you rotate it with another one that's regenerating and you kind of switch them back and forth. So already you bought the system twice and now they need to be insulated um, heated, which is an energy cost, or now you need um, vacuum pumps, etc. So that partially offsets the cost of the uh, disposable pellets, but not completely. Um, this could still be uneconomical. However, the benefit of this is that molecular sieves can purify your ethanol 100% purity. Like this is what laboratories would do if they need to produce 99.99% pure ethanol. This is the method they would use: molecular sieves. Um, then we get to the other mechanism, which is taking advantage of differential vaporization. So this would be the distillation method. This is basically taking advantage of the fact that when you boil uh, a liquid mixture of ethanol and water, the vapors that come off um, will be enriched in ethanol up to the azeotrope point, but I'll mention that in a second. So, you know, if you capture the vapors, say you're boiling a mixture 40%, the vapor's 70% ethanol. If you take that vapor and recondense it, well, now you've upgraded it. You've, you've created a more pure um, ethanol mixture. So what fractional distillation is, is, is the column basically does this step over and over again. And it's, a, it's the most efficient way of separating 
a large stream of water and ethanol up to very pure ethanol um, economically and efficiently as possible. Now there's a problem called the azeotrope. So in the water ethanol mixture, if it's 95% ethanol, water and ethanol boil at one to one at the exact same rate. So it's, it's impossible to use distillation to go above 95%. Um, and you'll see that if we go to the next slide, there's a picture of the, the vapor liquid equilibrium for water and ethanol. So what this chart is telling you is you can see the two lines. The bigger the gap between the line, that is the bigger the difference between the vapor coming off and the liquid composition in ethanol purity for any given liquid percent. So you can see the bigger the gap, basically the easier it is at that point. So at low um, ethanol percentages, it's very easy, a single boiling, and it's you know double, triple the amount of ethanol. But as you move to more and more pure, as you move right on this graph, you can see you reach the azeotrope point where it's one to one. This is basically showing us that it gets harder and harder and harder to get to 95% ethanol using distillation. And then above that, obviously, it can't, can't be done. You have to use molecular sieves and a hybrid system, but that's even more expensive and complicated, although it's possible to reproof up to 200 proof or 100% ethanol in, in your process. So we have our series of, of F columns that we can custom engineer, starting any percent, going to any percent up to 95, basically any flow rate. Um, so that's an option for very large scale. It's the most efficient way to do it per unit volume at large scale but it's a large capital cost. So when we look at your process, I mean, depending on exactly what you want to spend, what your scale is, um, what your operating costs you want to run at are, um, we think we have a, a really great option. So as commented earlier, the four in one oil ethanol recovery system, because we're boiling that, um, your solvent mixture, obviously to separate it from the oil, we're already doing distillation. We're doing simple single step distillation anyway. You're already basically spending the energy to boil it. So with our diverting technology and sensing and uh, using our, our simulation software and testing, we've developed a method to use this uh, single step distillation as almost like a free um, separation step or free distillation step. And this can remove a small amount of water. So depending on how much water you're picking up in your extraction, it's possible that the ORS, the OERS form one can maintain your ethanol between 80 and 90% without using a sieve, without using a column, and without um, buying fresh ethanol and kind of cutting that into your solvent inventory to keep it at a higher percent. So we really think this could be the cheapest and easiest way to deal with the, the water buildup problem, um, depending on the scale, depending on the exact situation. Yeah, so ethanol really right now is the industry standard and by far the most pro proven solvent outside of supercritical CO2. So we really see that as still the default one you're going to go with. Um, but there are other, other solvent extraction options. Um, and we can handle all of them. Our machines, like we come from the chemical industry, and we can handle other solvents beside ethanol, no problem. We can do the engineering, make sure your seals are right. Um, it's no problem for us to deal with something else. So, well, first we'll get into the hydrocarbons. So there's lighter and heavier hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons would just be, like the light ones would be butane, propane. And the reason you'd want to use these is because they have very, very little energy to boil. So I should mention ethanol is about 830 kilojoules per kilogram. That's just the unit measurement, how much energy it takes to boil a kilogram. So butane, I believe is about 40. So you can see a huge improvement. That means it would be dramatically cheaper in terms of electricity or gas costs to recover your oil out of butane. Um, downside lighter hydrocarbons is very flammable. They have a huge amount of explosive gas they're constantly putting off. So the whole process has to be sealed, pressurized. Um, you have limitations on how much you can keep on site. Basically the, engine, the difficulty, it's very difficult to deal with at large scale on the lighter hydrocarbons. So there's the heavier hydrocarbons like heptane, which is almost like gasoline, is one you know, or a carbon molecule less than, than gasoline. So it's basically a liquid at room temperature. Um, it has the similar extraction properties to lighter ones, but it's much easier to handle. You can have larger amounts of it. So it's kind of easier. And for reference, heptane is about 310 kilojoules per kilogram, so under half of ethanol. So you're still, there's a big energy saving 
And both the hydrocarbons, they produce a very, very clean extraction because I mentioned earlier how ethanol was polar and nonpolar. So the hydrocarbons are just nonpolar, which means they can't dissolve water, they can't dissolve um, starches, sugars, and chlorophylls. So all of that can be mechanically separated. Water will just tend to form a layer at the bottom. It won't dissolve into your mixture. So that basically solves that problem. Um, like I said, after very clean extraction, tends to just get your cannabinoids out. Um, so it really is, they're a pretty excellent solvent, but significantly more hazardous than ethanol, harder to deal with. Um, then there's supercritical CO2, which is kind of like the opposite. Um, it's more benign than ethanol. I mean, it, it's under extremely high pressure, which is its own challenge, but um, it tends to pull everything out. So you get, I don't know if you've ever seen CO2 extracted, um, or CO2 extracted solution, but it's like a thick paste. It's pulling a lot of things out of the plant that aren't our oil, our cannabinoids and terpenes that we want. So this thick paste then has to be winterized has to be processed pretty heavily to get it to an oil. So we have our TAWS unit, like I said, Kyle mentioned that we worked with a, a large CO2 extraction operation here, and we've worked out this downstream processing. So it is possible with our TAWS unit to winterize, to redissolve in our solvent of choice, um, this CO2 extracted paste, and filter out the waxes and fats and get a clean oil. And then we obviously recover it when our ORS unit and get it down to very, very clean, you know, zero residual ethanol. So that's a solved problem, but it's an extra step that you um, need to deal with, with CO2 extraction. Uh, and then finally, there's um, coming down the pipeline in the future, there's water-based extractions. This would be um, where you directly extract the cannabinoid acids, like CBDA, THCA, um, in aqueous solutions, and then use liquid-liquid separation to avoid um, the uh, ethan or the solvent extraction and it avoids a lot of problems, avoids having to boil it. However, a lot of these processes still involve like an able heptane separation step. So you're still going to need to deal with solvent, solvent recovery and maintaining closed loop solvents. And a lot of these um, are lab scale. They're, they're on the bench top right now. They haven't been industrialized. They haven't really been rolled out yet. So these are still future technologies. I just emphasize that for right now, Ethanol is really the proven kind of default choice you're, you're going to go with. Yeah, and I'll hand it back over to Kyle to kind of talk about where we're going to go on our webinar series from here. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lucas. Um, and yeah, so just uh, before we get into the Q&A section, a little sneak peek, a sneak peek. So up next, we have episode three, Revenge of the Myth. Hopefully you guys like our Star Wars naming theme. Uh, and during the next webinar, we'll be discussing the myths related to really like safety and room classification. So C1D1, C1D2, you know, do you need C1D1 or C1D2 equipment? Uh, do you need to build out a room to those standards? Uh, as well as like UL, CSA listings, do you really need those for the equipment or CE for Europe versus peer review? You know, what's really setting you up for success long term and where the industry is really going in regards to that? as well as really going into the kind of the myths around CGMP, EUGMP, and GPP standards. Um, and then rounding it out with you know, kind of the maximum solvent limits that a lot of people are trying to work within and how to deal with the fire marshals and local authorities and also different ways to work around those maximum solvent limits. So we'll be sending out um, a follow-up to everybody um, in a couple weeks' time with the updated date. We're looking at around this time to late August, uh, just to give you guys a heads up. Um, so now to head over to Q&A. We'll start with, a, we did get a few um, questions um, from sign up. So we'll start with those. And then for everybody else uh, who'd like to uh, still ask a question, uh, the webinar does have a Q&A option on the screen. So if you just scroll to the bottom with your mouse, um, you can just input some questions there. I see we've already gotten a couple, so we'll get to those shortly. Um, so this here was by Michael or Mikael. Um, how many times can you recycle the solvent specifically for food grade alcohol for, for botanical extraction? And what are other methods other than density to quickly measure the impurity to guarantee that it is food grade? Oh, good question. So in regards to how many times you can recycle the solvent, um, it really, you can technically infinitely reuse the solvent. Um, it really comes down to the recovery process that you utilize, the parameters that you use for the recovery process. And also if you're doing any other post-processing, like do you need to reproof or filter or do anything on the downstream, uh, on that ethanol stream of, um, the ethanol stream that's being recovered out. 
Um, but if as long as you're doing it under a temperature controlled, vacuum controlled and an automated solution, uh, you should be pulling a clean ethanol that can then be closed loop directly back to your ethanol extraction to be constantly reused. Um, and if you are carrying over some water, then just look at it and putting it in a reproofing solution in the middle there. Um, in regards to what other methods other than density, there are, Lucas, I'll hand that off to you. Yeah, sure. So we touched on density, which is a good point. So you've probably heard of hydrometers. That's typically how water ethanol mixtures are. You measure the ethanol or the alcohol percent. Um, that's a good way of doing it. Other than that, um, you're getting into more scientific grade equipment to, to measure impurities. So you'd probably be looking at the easiest thing would be send it to a third party lab with a spectroscopy. You can do it by shining light through it and look at the attenuation, basically checking how clear it is. Um, other sensing technologies like uh, hydrophilic membranes to try and measure how much water. Um, but really the practical ways we, we've seen is, um, like you mentioned earlier about ethanol contamination, it tends to build up a color if you're getting bad recovery or your, your recovery settings are wrong. Um, and smells, like obviously terpenes have a very strong smell, it's very obvious. So if you have your recovery settings right, um, you shouldn't have too much to worry about. Also obviously ethanol, very toxic bacteria, you're not really gonna have to worry about um, organic buildup. And the recovery itself, like if you're boiling it, especially if you're using like an F-series fractionation column, it's being filtered and boiled and condensed many times. Um, the whole point is that only ethanol, pure ethanol makes it through this process. So just the recovery step itself will, will help maintain um, very pure ethanol. But the answer would probably be either buy spectroscopy equipment or send it to a third party lab. Um, to really ensure exactly how pure it is. So Walid has the question, how long can the recycled solvent be reused? What are the indications of solvent quality? So this is similar to the previous question, Walid, so hopefully we've answered a bunch of them already. Um, but yeah, the easiest indications, honestly, if you're just on site and you want to just take a look, take a look at the color, uh, give it a smell, now don't stick your head in, you know, give it a, a go off and, uh, and, and for smell, um, spectrometer. Um, but yeah, smell and visual is the easiest way to just take a quick look. Um, but other than that, you can then send it to a lab. If you wanna do exact testing for small compounds or other things that could be carried over. Um, but color and smell are the main two things. Especially you wanna avoid color contamination, especially darker color contaminations, because that means you're carrying over product, uh, which is not good. Which solvent is commonly used for extraction and why, uh, Thomas? Well, Thomas, the main two right now in the cannabis and hemp space would be CO2 and ethanol extraction. Um, CO2, uh, because theoretically, though you still need to do a winterization step where ethanol would be utilized, you help reduce the amount of ethanol required on site. So it can help reduce the, you know, the amount of C1, D1, or C2 uh, zoning you need or get around solvent limitations in a space. Um, but in regards to scaling the technology, uh, what we're really seeing right now, especially when scaling hemp extraction technology, is really moving continuously more and more towards cryoethanol extraction or some hybrid of cryo and warm ethanol extraction process. Uh, just because from a scaling and automation standpoint, uh, the goal is, especially with cryoethanols, you remove the whole winterization step. You move a complete other filtration step as well. So by going with the cryo uh, process, you help streamline it. Kind of just like how the ore streamlines the three-in-one process of bulk, residual, and decarb. When scaling, the less steps you can have, the less operator intervention, and the less chance for product contamination with open air or op opportunities for oper operator air, um, the better, right? So that's really where ethanol is right now, let's say, the main leader when it comes to um, scaling and also just in general for extraction. And this is from Gustavo. What configuration is the best for CBD and THE considering decarboxylation and winterization? Um, Gustavo, it really depends on the end products you're gonna make. Um, different extraction methods have different also um, strengths for, and we'll, we can dive into this and possibly it might be a good actually a suggestion for a future webinar um, for different products. Generally though, like I was just mentioning for CBD coming, let's say a CBD specific grown plants, let's say the hemp industry, it really is moving towards cryoethanol extraction from a scaling standpoint, just because it reduces the number of steps required. For THC, there's still a lot of people running, you know, there's a lot, we're seeing more and more towards ethanol extraction, 
but there's still a lot of people running CO2 extraction and butane extraction depending on their end products. And then Jerry, are there economies or economics of scale or the scale up economics? Well, yes. Um, you know, making a 100 pound per day operation and scaling it to 200 pounds per day, you're really not looking at significantly increasing costs, even though you're doubling your production throughputs. And these, these costs really, really scale nicely, especially as you grow, you know, going from a uh, hundred to 200, 200 to a thousand, thousand to a couple thousand is a really nice process. You see that next limit or that next jump really occur around the two to 3000 pounds per day. And that really comes into more so the automation for dealing with that large amounts of just the volume, all the biomass being fed in, all the material handling and so forth. So still have questions. Well, first off, you can definitely, there's a reach out to both Lucas and myself. You have our numbers there as well as our emails, uh, but we will touch base on the Q and A here. So first, okay. First up here was just anonymous, anonymously asked was what is downstream processing? Um, downstream, so upstream, downstream um, are, let's say, industrial production terms that are used to explain a process. So in regards to what is downstream processing, when I was talking about it, let's say earlier in the discussion, um, about after you have your decarb full spectrum oil that could be ready for downstream processing, I was referring to kind of distillate production, production, or whatever mm -hmm. else you might want to do on it because it's further down the stream. Uh, and that could go all the way to, to producing like an isolate powder of CBD. Yeah. Yeah. And also THC remediation, all those technologies mm -hmm. occur further down the line. Um, another one is how much is the ORS? So I'm assuming you mean the OR, OERS, the ORS compared to the three other systems like the falling film. So when you look at the ORS in regards to compared to a falling film solution, um, a residual recovery solution such as a rotovap and a decarb reactor, uh, you will definitely save money, um, especially on operational costs, and there will be savings on capital costs. Uh, but the biggest savings are definitely on the operational cost side. Another question was, will we still need winterization if we use cold ethanol? Um, Lucas, would you want to take that? or should? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, I think we touched on this in the last presentation as well. Yep. But... Um, that would be a big benefit of doing cryoethanol or cold ethanol. Um, I think I said last time it, 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 it depends how pure you need to get your, your crude oil. And if that's going to be your final product, generally you really don't. If, like I said, the key is maintaining your ethanol cold. A lot of times, even if you pre-chill the ethanol, then it goes to the extraction. It's warming up the whole time. You know, can you really keep the whole process really cold? And we have a, I think a pretty innovative way of achieving this, but if you can keep it really cold the whole time, you're basically winterizing as you go. It's already, you know, it's extracting while winterizing. Um, if you just go through a series of filters after you've, you've had your, you have the ethanol's had its resonance time with the biomass, you just mechanically filter out the plant material. Any tiny amount of wax that was pulled out would tend to just stick to that filter. Um, so you really don't need a winterization step. Any, if you're going, especially like, let's go back to the first question, if you're doing any downstream, like say you want to produce a distillate, um, you really, you don't need to winterize because then that'll come out and say there is a tiny amount of um, waxes left in the not winterized cold ethanol extracted oil, that would be cleaned up with the distillation machine. That's what I was getting at with it depends where you're going. So if you're going to distillate, I'd say you can just forget about winterization if you do a cold ethanol. Yeah. And then the one thing I'll add in there and really reinforce is what Lucas was saying is um, a lot of people too, when they're doing a cryo extraction process, it's not about, they're saying, okay, we chilled our ethanol to minus 40, but it's not about keeping the solution or during that whole extraction step right up through at minus 40. So there's a big delta T, a big change in temperature that often occurs, right? So as long as you do have a good, uh, a great extraction process where it's insulating, keeping the entire process at minus 40 C, you can really look at skipping um, mm -hmm. mineralization with cryoethanol extraction. So Carlos asked, what is your opinion about reverse osmosis for water removal from ethanol? Well, Lucas, mm -hmm. you better see for this question. Huh. Interesting question. So, hmm. That would be um, a type of sieve. Um, I didn't touch on that. 
issue with that is that it produces a stream of downgraded ethanol. So if you ever had like a reverse osmosis system for water, um, it constantly has a waste stream of water that's more contaminated. And then obviously the stream you want the water, it's very pure. So it doesn't just take your whole stream and make the whole stream purified. It kind of, you know what I mean? So um, that wouldn't be a great option for doing a closed loop setup. Um, you'd probably, that could assist maybe a sieve system. You would do that as a first step. Um, but interesting point. Yeah, it's something uh, I didn't think about. It hasn't really been, it's not really used industrially. So that's why it hasn't come up. But uh, I'll probably yeah, do some research. It's an interesting point. Yeah. Um, and then what is the cost difference? This was anonymous. What is the cost difference between CO2 and ethanol extraction? Um, generally, from a scaling point of view, ethanol extraction is less expensive. At small, yeah. I can't answer that directly. Um, but, it's, but you do have the extra cost with CO2 of dealing with the whole winterization, extra filtration steps, which adds to some extra capital cost and equipment that's required. Uh, but there's depending on the facility you have and the space you have, you might be able to save money then um, in regards to zoning or how you have to build out mm -hmm. the facility. So it, it really becomes project specific at smaller scales. At larger scales, um, ethanol extraction, you'd save more money on. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, whoever asked it anonymously, if you do want to send us an email, we can really look at your, your specifically and really dive into that a little bit more detail and provide recommendations and consult. Um, and Kalinda asked if we provide isolate equipment. Um, yes, we do. So if you have any question, if you need anything, we can provide a full turnkey solution from your biomass in right through to distillate or isolate, whatever your requirement is, or full spectrum oil or any off mix of the three. So if you have any, you're looking for that, that's something that you can definitely contact myself, Lucas, or anybody else from the Maritech team uh, to inquire about for your project. Um, Another one was if it's better to decarb before extraction to have less problems with water. That's a good question. Um, mm. Very good question. Generally, if you're doing CO2 extraction, a lot of people will decarb their biomass before CO2 extraction to help reduce, especially for CO2, you want to remove as much water as possible. Um, before ethanol extraction, people will just generally let it just dry it. You don't need to go yeah. decarb before extraction. Um, Lucas? This is something we did analyze. I remember doing the engineering on this. And I think it just comes down to, um, you have to think about the farther down the process you go, the less material you have to deal with and the more valuable it is. So if you try and decarb before you extract, you're de you have to heat you know, thousands of pounds of plant material up to decarboxylate it and then extract it. But if you wait till after, you might have tens or like hundreds of pounds of oil so it's, it's easier um, and, and way more efficient to decarb after. But it is possible to decarb first. People do do that. Usually it's yeah, more scale. Yeah. Um, and one other thing to note too is depending on the temperatures you're decarbing with the biomass too, uh, you might have terpenes and other volatiles that are burned off. Um, another anonymous question was, what is the percent cannabinoids coming out of the ore system with cold and warm ethanol? How about after winterization? Um, a big thing that'll play into that is your biomass and your feed stream. Generally, you're looking at, um, Lucas, you'd say 70 to 80%. Sorry, of uh, like recovery the, efficiency. No, the percent efficient. cannabinoids within the oil stream. Or are you, uh, sorry, this question, it could be also for the ethanol stream. Ideally, in the ethanol stream, you're going to have 0% cannabinoids going along with the ethanol stream. But in regards to your decarb full spectrum oil, um, it, really, it really comes into your, your front end side um, and your, the biomass, the cannabinoid yield within the biomass feeding it. But yeah, ideally, mm -hmm. and if you're doing a good crisp, clean, clear, uh, crisp, cold extraction operation, you should be seeing um, yeah, 60 to 80%. Um, we know of groups uh, we're, that we're working with where they're going cold, or even seen higher yields. Um, yeah, I think if you're talking about with warm, you will get, because there is a tiny amount of cannabinoids, as I understand, in the plant cells and in the stock itself, besides just the, the trichomes. 
I mean, almost all of it's in the trichomes. So I do think if you do a warm, you technically will get a little bit more cannabinoids. Obviously, both depend on how good your extraction is. There's other little tricks, like you can inject clean ethanol at various points to kind of wash the plant to get that last little bit out. So forgetting all this, assuming you're doing everything as good as you can before, you will get a tiny bit less with cold. But like I said before, with, with warm, you're getting the water and you're getting the other contaminants. So it's a tiny bit of a trade-off. Um, and then another question here was, at what level or pounds per day should I switch from butane to either CO2 or ethanol? Mm -hmm. Well, butane, um, butane has a limit on how big a fire marshal will let you scale. Uh, the amount of butane uh, someone will let you have on site in a facility will be very, very limited. Um, so I, I actually don't have the exact answer where from a cost benefit analysis it would make that trade off. But if you're looking at already getting towards, you know, higher hundreds to a thousand pounds per day, I definitely would already start be moving towards ethanol because the amount of butane on site could get quite significant. Um, but I don't have that exact answer about where the number trade off would be. That's something that if you contacted us, we could go into for your mm -hmm. specific operation and look we'd have to look at the process and yeah, yeah. and the whole whole thing all together. Uh, and then Dave asked, "Will I get better results if I heat the ethanol with the flour material still in there?" So uh, I'll touch on this first a little bit, Lucas, and then uh, I think it'd be a good one for you to chime in too. Generally. If you use a cryoethanol extraction process compared to a warm ethanol extraction process, the warm ethanol extraction process, like Lucas said, you'll get a little bit, you'll get ideally some cannabinoids out of the plant material, but you'll get a lot more of everything else along with it. Um, so if you are actually to heat the ethanol with the flour material in there, um, I don't have the exact answer, but it would get, you would get more out of it than using, let's say, a minus 40 degree ethanol with the exact but you'd be getting a lot of other things out, especially you know, in a warm process, water, chlorophyll, and other water solubles. Um, so it'd be like a darker oil. Sorry? It'd be like a darker oil, you could think of. Yeah. Darker, heavier oil. So, I mean, if you wanted a more full spectrum extract, I mean, you, you could do that. But say, yeah, if you're going to distillate, that would probably create more problems for you because especially starch and sugar, is a huge problem in distillate machines. You really don't want that. It can be such a problem that we might need to add an entirely other step, which is not mentioned, just to deal with that itself. So it all depends exactly what your end product is and what kind of what market needs you want to go after. And then the last question here on our Q and A. So if you guys have any other questions, just so you guys uh, know, um, please do shoot those to us by email. Um, oh, another one popped up here. So we'll be asking, answering two. But the first one is, if the extraction produces 80% cannabinoids, what's the remaining 20%? Fats, waxes, lipids, Lucas? Chlorophyll, sugar, yeah. even some terpenes, were, um, some possibly like degraded cannabinoids that have got overheated for whatever reason or, or partially broke down. Um, yeah, that's about it. And then, uh, and that's where like when you, people are looking to make a distillate, right? So when they're looking for a crisp, clear, clean oil for vapes or whatever not, um, that's what that distillation step would really come in. It'd be like a white film or spinning band column process. And this would be done after um, the ores system. And then Lucas, great question for you. How do you remove starch and sugar? Talk about what we were just saying. <sighs> Perfect. You love I knew this I right brought now. it up. Um, this we haven't done before. This I remember I was talking to another group, a consultant, uh, a week or two ago. Um, there's a liquid liquid separation. Um, I'm sorry, I, really, I don't recall off the top of my head the details of that process, but it would be an entirely other step. You'd have another closed loop. I think it's a water based substance that you're dissolving. The sugar will tend to dissolve into it out of the oil, and then you can um, kind of decant it out. I'm sorry, I'm, I really apologize. You have to contact us. And if, if you want to do warm and you want to go to distillation, this is something we designed your process. And like, you know, we have, we have other contacts and partners um, that would yeah. help us do that. And, and kind of to jump in there too, like uh, 
I think, Lucas, you're looking a little bit more on the specific side, because this is something that will also be removed in the distillation step as well. So yeah. through the distillation step, the starches and sugars will be removed kind of in bulk there. But if you're looking for what Lucas was talking about there with some of our new R&D projects and also this, these Rafi having clients that are asking us about trying to remove it directly from the biomass material on the front end side as well too, um, and other processes there too. But it would definitely be pulled out in the distillation phase where, you're, where we're making distillate. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, okay, could you just mention the use of denatured ethanol with heptane? So we have a lot of clients that use denatured ethanol. Um, and actually, if you wanted to, our systems, you could, you could make it not denatured. You could actually use the system to separate that out of the ethanol, though technically necessarily wouldn't be legal in the state. Uh, but anyways, um, so it's not a problem for us at all. Um, and if you wanted to, you could even use temperature to separate the during all in one process, separate the heptane stream separate from the ethanol stream altogether. Mm. Um, yeah, but it's no problem because our systems yeah. um, get rid of all the residual solvent. Um, we can completely dry out your oil. So you can use um, solvents that would be hazardous to drink, like denatured ethanol to drink. But because we're, we're getting rid of all of it, it really is not a concern. Well, thank you, honestly, everybody for joining us today. Um, it's been, uh, been a fun hour here. Um, and like I said, the, there's our email and our phone numbers. Give us a shout if you have any questions or if you have an upcoming project, or even if you'd like us to take a look at your existing process, you know, and how we can maybe help you remove some bottlenecks. Or if you have your own concept or technology that you'd like to partner with us with to turn that idea into a full-fledged concept and incorporate into, let's say, a turnkey extraction facility or anything like that, um, please give us a shout. Otherwise, thank you very much, everyone, and we hope you enjoy the rest of the summer, and we look forward to seeing you at episode three, Revenge of the Myth, uh, coming up in uh, about a month here. So you take care. Thanks very much, everybody.